So let's set the stage. The year is 2001. The start of the new millennium has been much more tough than anyone could have really predicted, but as the year is coming to a close, there's one thing to be very excited for in the video game boom that the world's greatest selling console ever, the PlayStation 2, has brought. The next chapter of tactical espionage action, Metal Gear Solid 2. Three years prior on the console's predecessor, Hideo Kojima and his team had produced this game's predecessor, Metal Gear Solid, one of the most beloved of all time, easily reaching the top 10 ever sold on the PlayStation 1. It was a follow-up to the much less known Metal Gear series on the MSX home computer in the 80s, which followed the adventures of Solid Snake. He becomes a legendary soldier across the original two games, defeating Big Boss, the father he was cloned from, and saving the world from Metal Gear, a bipedal, nuclear-capable war machine. The story will get more and more convoluted, don't worry. But there's not much more to cover story-wise in those original titles. A home computer release in 1987 didn't exactly have all the space in the world for story. But this set the stage for the solid expansion of the series, where we pick up with a retired snake dragged back in for one more mission. His brother, Liquid Snake, has overtaken a military base in Alaska on Shadow Moses Island and threatens the world with a new Metal Gear named Rex, which can launch a warhead via railgun, avoiding all current missile detection systems. Of course, it was a secret project that Snake's command team once kept in the dark at all costs, so he's fighting from behind and without proper support for most of the mission. In this mire of conspiracy and secrecy, Snake emerges as the victor against all odds, defeating super soldiers, psychic shams, tanks, helicopters, and massive death machines alike to prevent total disaster. While the story does provide an apt twist on what hero truly means, there's no denying that Snake embodies the qualities we typically associate with the heroes of action movies. He's gritty but likable, flirty with every single woman he meets, but also fighting to save them when push comes to shove, quipping even in the most dire circumstances because he's never thrown off as cool. This is no coincidence, Kojima hasn't exactly been secretive about how 80s action movies influenced Solid Snake, from the name Snake being lifted from Escape from New York Snake Plissken, to appearing much like the character Martin Riggs in Lethal Weapon. He rejects the label of hero, yet he continues to perform his duties, knowing that he can claim control by fighting for what he wants to fight for, not what he's told to fight for. Going against the grain, both in his narrative and outside of it, he became one of the most beloved characters gaming had ever seen, a fantasy man who's calm, cool, collected, womanizing, a lone soldier strong enough to take down an entire army. At the end of the day, it's still a ridiculous video game built on action, no matter how much the story is against what hero usually means. So when the PS2 era rolled around and hit E3 2000, Konami revealed a trailer for Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, a fair amount of hype began to build around this title. The trailer was Snake Snake Snake, back again, and with many more polygons. The gameplay, the graphics, knowing Kojima it was going to be an innovative and exciting experience, playing through a new era of technological advancement with one of the most beloved characters of all time. And in 2001, that came true, as fans received their copies of the game and dug into the mission. A tanker was carrying a new Metal Gear, which Snake and Otacon, his partner gained in Shadow Moses, seek to reveal to the public, continuing years of anti-Metal Gear activity they've been on since defeating Rex. We see the new path Snake found that he spoke about at the end of the prior game. Now he exists to give the world a future free from these terror of walking nuclear death machines. But a few hours later, that hope and excitement turned into a mass of confusion. Ocelot returns, but with Liquid Snake's arm infecting his mind, steals the new Metal Gear, sinks the Taker and Snake along with it, and we pick up two years later with a new agent called Snake with a clearly different voice. He's tasked with entering the Big Shell, an environmental cleanup facility where the tanker sank two years prior, which has been taken over by terrorists, on the day of the president's visit. He infiltrates underwater, sneaking past just a few guards before an elevator ride up reveals the character in full, exactly like Metal Gear Solid opened years prior. But this time, he's following in someone else's footsteps, someone else who entered first and snuck in before he could, someone who seems a lot like Snake. 
Riding up the elevator after him, we get the reveal of Raiden, a character who received, well, a much different reaction than Snake for a couple reasons. First of all, it wasn't Snake, the character people had come to know and love. The entire marketing of the game was about him ever revealing the second and much larger act of the game. People were pissed that they'd been sold an experience which wasn't true, that wasn't that thing that they'd spent a year excited for. They got the game they wanted, but not the game they wanted. But it's not just Snake being replaced, it's who he was replaced with. As people started getting into Raiden's section of the game, they weren't liking the character who was coming into form. Where Snake was 80s macho action hero, flirting with every woman and getting angry about lies but pushing forward anyway in control of his situation, Raiden was described as effeminate with in-game characters even confusing his gender. He was in a committed relationship to someone just as unlikable in Rose, who people avoided saving to hear less of, and when he was faced with adversity he complained and was forced to continue, where Snake chose to continue of his own will. Of course, this was a deliberate ploy by Kojima, and we've covered all of this background so far because the distinctions between Snake and Raiden are crucial to understanding the point of Raiden and the game's overall message. We could point to a lot of things to show how different they are, but there's one which is most notable and obvious to me, which also changed how I viewed the characters. I always felt the criticism that Raiden was whiny was simply a result of how a story like this is told. The main character, kept in the dark, has to lash out in search of the truth in order for it to be slowly revealed to the player. Even in the former entry, most of the dialogue is Snake just repeating what someone just said to him with a question mark so they can explain it further, for our sake as the player. Raiden of course does the same thing, and I always figured it was simply because people were annoyed at the swap that they felt Snake doing it was fine and Raiden doing it so was whiny. But it is more than this. Snake and Raiden each speak with their commanding officer, Colonel Roy Campbell, throughout the mission, as this second game is designed, both within universe and outside, to resemble the first game. Each protagonist goes through a period where they begin to question the Colonel directly, believing that he's withholding information from them as other characters slowly reveal secret happenings. For example, when Raiden, after fighting an agile vampire named Vamp, meets a mysterious Lieutenant Pliskin who just so happens to look and sound a lot like Snake, the Colonel tells Raiden to ignore him and work alone like they planned, shunting off the oddities of the mission Raiden raises. It happens again later when he faces off against one of the terrorists, Fat Man, a mad bomber who knows nothing about the demands Raiden was told they made. When suspicious things like this happen to Snake, he was very much in control of the situation. He's shouting for the truth, yes, but a tough guy always with his macho tone, and the colonel is lost for words, quiet and more submissive in response, knowing that he can't simply control Snake. Instead, he has to plead with him to continue, which Snake does of his own volition. At the end of the day, they are friends, and the soldier seeks to help out his commander, who repays the favor at the end. Raiden in this situation is a very different response. Where the former felt in control of his arguments, applying pressure to uncover the truth, Raiden is much less so. As he progresses through this mission in the big shell, going from the disposal of bombs laid by Fat Man that threatened to ignite the cleanup chemicals and destroy the environment for decades to come, to tracking down the president through a secret service agent Ames who tells him that that whole story is actually a lie, there are no chemicals and no $30 billion ransom, his understandable confusion leads to a few arguments with command. He tends to lash out again and again about the pain of it all, arguing with a colonel who is much less responsive, standing firm against Raiden's objections. He's clearly the less powerful one here, getting nowhere with his complaints, and in fact where Snake leveraged the power of being on the ground in the situation, Raiden gives it up. He doesn't continue because he sought to do so as Snake did, he instead asks for orders to continue, ceding control of his involvement back to the colonel. Are those my orders? Yes, they are. He sounds annoyed, but he's still asking for orders, to be told what to do, even if he has no reason or desire to. This is a small but very important distinction. It paints two different pictures from the same materials, one of a strong-willed individual soldier, and one of a weak man who only does what he's told, who only holds obligation as motivation. 
And so after Ames reveals the president's location, suddenly dies a mysterious death and a cyborg ninja swoops in to save him, Raiden moves out to find the president under these orders, despite his arguments and questions. This is an interesting shift coming from the series, which has seemed to be all about the will of the individual in the accomplishment of these missions. It's something clearly seen with Snake, and what his former commander says was the lesson learned from Shadow Moses. If there's a crucial tactical detail that case taught us, it was the power of the operative's will to survive. Raiden, despite going through VR training for hundreds of missions, including a recreation of Shadow Moses, sees it very differently, saying that personal feelings have no place in a mission. It's another point of distinction, the same situation leading to different conclusions based only on these two men's mindsets. But it furthers this obligatory aspect of Raiden's character. He's not saying it as, say, a judge would in separating themselves from the emotional aspect of a case for more fair results, because we've seen in the prior game that that emotional aspect actually makes the better outcome more achievable. There's a great point of tension in the first game where Meryl, the woman Snake falls in love with mid-mission, has her survival pinned on your ability to withstand a torture sequence that requires rapidly pressing the same button. The actual gameplay of it is minimal, but it's one of the most tense moments, testing a very focused persistence to keep going again and again and again, with the emotional backing of knowing a character you now care for dies if you fail. Both for Snake and for us, these emotions lead us to persist through different kinds of turmoil. When Raiden says there's no place for emotions, what he really means is that he wants to be detached from this. It's his job, and that's where it ends. He doesn't want to care about the outcome, he doesn't want a Meryl to fight for, because that's the kind of thing that drives one to sacrifice of themselves, to dig deeper into the mission and to see it through no matter how hard. It places one in the seat of pain, not allowing them to pull back, removing that shield of indifference and that at the end of the day, if Raiden fails, it's understandable, he wants that in place. We can never truly expect one man to accomplish all of this, so if he doesn't want to, then he might not have to. He wants a state where the order might always come to pull back now, and he has nothing that makes him not want to. But the colonel keeps ordering him forward when he asks, and so even as he finds the president, who reveals that he was working with the terrorists in order to garner a bargaining chip against the patriots, who are essentially the American Illuminati who stage every happening in the country, showing that all Raiden has known his entire life up to this and including this mission is a lie, Raiden just keeps pressing forward still. It is a lot to process. This cleanup facility is actually the cover for a new model of Metal Gear, a whole arsenal of them in fact. While the president wanted to bargain with it, Solidus, the terrorist leader, wants to use it to detonate a nuke above Manhattan, frying all electrical devices as a countermeasure against some new form of digital information control the Patriots are about to launch. But before everything can be learned, the president has to die as his vital signs confirm the activation. Raiden refuses to kill him despite his pleas, but Ocelot shoots the president himself, an odd move from a man on the terrorist side. But there's no time to waste to figure that out. Raiden now has to track down Emma Emmerich, the only programmer left on the shell who can help them stop this rapidly approaching digital threat. What we begin to see in all this chaos is a man who is readily avoiding pain and conflict, who craves detachment from the situations around him for a comfortable and safe distance. But as the mission progresses and he encounters not just mad bombers forcing him to perform new tasks and knife crazy vampires that could pin your shadow with a blade, but even untouchable incarnations of Lady Luck who cannot be hit by bullets, Raiden begins to see there's more at play to succeed in these conditions than what he wanted there to be. You need something higher. It has to be pure will, backed up by, by courage or ideals. This is partially what the colonel tried to impress upon him in the beginning, saying that emotions were required. Raiden's statement simply chooses how those emotions are expressed. But only with a self-made twist, and only through experience does Raiden come to see this. Now, that's perfectly understandable. I've been told many things only to doubt their validity and find it in my arrogance leading to pain later. But what's interesting is that he doesn't see it as a mistake, but as a sort of discovery of his own. 
He yells it at the people who tried to tell it to him as if it's something new only he knows. It's his defense against the Colonel, a way to tell them how much he's suffering and how distinct he is from the others. Because if this mission requires something more, and he's making it through, then he must have that, right? He must be special. It is more than just selfish, though, as he uses it to defend Solid Snake's name. The legendary soldier was blamed for the Taker sinking two years prior, but upon meeting this mysterious Pliskin, who's for sure definitely not Snake, but helps him out massively, Raiden can't see the former hero becoming a terrorist. He definitely wants Pliskin to be him to validate this feeling, and upon essentially confirming it is, he defends Snake and Otacon, saying they couldn't be evil because they have that immutable quality to continuing a mission like this, what that thing requires. Right after this, he gets to talk it all over with Snake directly, and asks him about why they chose to be here, in distinction from Raiden, who was forced to be here. I'm here because I was assigned to this mission, not because I want to. I'd be out of here in a second. What both of the pair express to him is essentially the same thing we've been saying again and again. They include an aspect of responsibility, yes. Otacon was in part responsible for the development of Rex, and so he feels a duty to atone for his mistakes. He also has a sister here on the big shell, and wants to protect a single person in that world he seeks to protect everyone in just the same. That person is the programmer, Emma, who Raiden does help to save. When he does so, she reveals to him the data control scheme. GW, an AI included in Arsenal Gear, is set to form a massive web of digital censorship, controlling what people do and don't see in this new era of rapid information so the Patriots can maintain order. They're falling behind in the age of infobesity because each and every person now has the ability to contribute to the mass of information. Before, information underwent a sort of natural selection when it required resources to carry it on. Only so many stories can be remembered, only so many books can be printed, and the humans who remember it will all pass on eventually. And so, carefully, people decided what was and wasn't worth surviving, creating what we knew as human history. But now, with endless, nearly timeless storage and constant accessibility, as well as the individual ability to create and post, there's both no natural selection of data, as well as such a massive amount of it that the important aspects become clouded under mundanity and uselessness. The Patriots no longer believe they could effectively shape the world narrative in these conditions, as they did with the tanker incident two years prior, blaming it on Snake even though that was false. So this is now what Raiden and Snake are trying to stop. But that's all a bit of a sidetrack for later, back to motivations for now. Now, Snake feels the same kind of duty to the future that Otacon mentions, which he decided is his reason to live. He's a clone of a legendary soldier, literally created to fight, and yet he decided he would use those skills and past he can't escape for good, fighting but for a better future. He quotes his close friend turned battlefield enemy Grey Fox, saying, we're not tools of the government. Fighting was the only thing I was good at, but at least I always fought for what I believed in. It's an expression that, no, they can't escape the situations they're forced into, but they can't decide why they survive them. They can use those skills for their own reasons. It's a positive and easy message. There's always a force in our life driving us to obligation, but we have a hand in that. Whether we choose to be on this mission or not, we can make it at least in part ours. However, despite having just defended Snake and Otacon against claims of terrorism on the basis of something higher, called ideals or courage, anything like that, now Raiden slanders them for seemingly the same reason. He questions their status as an anti-Metal Gear NGO called Philanthropy, and says what they do sounds more like terrorism than activism. It's a very sudden shift from speaking with the Colonel to not long after speaking with them. Did Kojima forget a step in writing here? While his scripts certainly aren't flawless, this one is no mistake. This inconsistency in Raiden's character and his reactions is the point. He's a weak man looking for the best feeling in every situation and justifying it on the spot, not against what existed of his own character before. What he hears from Snake and Otacon is that they're good people doing something beneficial for the future, fighting against a great power of their own volition. They are what he presented himself to as the colonel in saying it took something like courage. But seeing others the same way is less appealing. 
He wanted to hear that it was all an obligation from them as well, that they didn't want to be here but had to be here for some reason, because that would make him feel better about his own distaste for being here, how he has no desire to fight for the futures of others. He wants others to be terrible so he could be terrible. This is in line with why he seeks out orders of his own will. When we act on our own impulses and desires, we are placing a responsibility for their effects on ourselves. But when we accept and follow orders, we get, well, I was just following orders. If the mission fails, if people die, it's not Bryden's fault, it's the fault of what he was told to do. The less responsibility he takes for his life, the higher the chances he gets to feel ignorant bliss. Everything about him is seeking out that comfy feeling. If this is something he seeks out above all, then we must see it in everything he chooses, and so of course we find it in his relationship with Rose as well. She's an analyst that was thrown into the mission at the last second, under the premise that the former agent had an emergency. Upon learning this, Raiden is angry, making a statement about personal feelings having no place in the mission. Rather than being happy, he can maintain contact with Rose during these times, the first hint of what's really at play here. Now, Rose is one of the most hated aspects of this game, as most people wrote that their relationship added soap opera elements in the midst of their tactical espionage action. Raiden, trying to save the world, would then have to deal with his relationship drama, constantly bothered about if he knew what the next day was. It was April 30th, the day they met two years ago. Much like Raiden, players were bothered that during an intense mission, periods of time were taken out to be badgered about romance. They didn't want personal feelings in their mission either. But I think we have to reconsider our perspective on this. If you were fighting off vampires and harriers, questioning the very idea of truth as you uncover deep conspiracies, you probably wouldn't just want to get back to the action, you'd want to take a moment to slow down and comprehend it all. We can hate the lols only because we are detached from the situation. And it's not like Ryan doesn't take moments away from the action himself to catch his breath and his sanity. When Rose is forcing him to talk about something else for a moment, it's doing what Snake actually asked for in the first game, when he wanted to hear anyone's voice to ignore his painful situation for a moment. Of course, there is some self-serving aspect to what she does, but it is also done out of care, a care Raiden never really recognizes. It's more that he didn't want her to be around in these tough times where she could catch a glimpse of him weakened and unideal, where she'd have a chance to see what's really underneath. He wants to stay as us, detached, so that he can follow orders and nothing more. A constant note is that, just like he is during the mission, he keeps Rose at arm's length despite their two-year relationship. They clearly have a connection with some level of care and trust, but it's obvious that Raiden is the less involved one, always being dragged into their talks and never initiating. They don't stay together during the night, she has no idea where he's from or how he grew up, and he never even lets her see his room looks like, let alone spend a night together. Now, there is a good reason for some of these, and it's because of his awful past that comes back to him in nightmares. He was a child soldier in a nondescript civil war, the adopted child of Saul the Snake, who's not just the terrorist leader, but also the secret third clone and former president who greenlit Metal Gear Rex. The pair meet again since Raiden takes Emma's virus to destroy DW, but it's interrupted at 90%, leaving he and Snake with no choice but to board Arsenal and stop Saul this directly. To get aboard though, Snake uses Raiden as bait for their insider Olga, also the cyborg ninja, and so he's captured and tortured by Saul this and Ocelot, a consequence of getting aboard. It's here that the former reveals more about his ambitions in his fight against the Patriots, who may have been manipulating this whole situation, as well as telling this backstory for his son. Forced to serve in the war, young Raiden was so effective that he earned the nickname Jack the Ripper. They were fed only if they did well, and even then the food was mixed with gunpowder to keep them hallucinating and controllable. After the war's end, he was taken away by an NGO and placed in the States with a much better life. Raiden says he doesn't recall all of the past, but that it comes back to him in bits and pieces in these terrors. He didn't want Rose to be around for it, and he never told her about any of it because he didn't want to see her get hurt by who he was. As he shouts, Told you what? That I'm a killer? And always have been? But of course, it's the oldest excuse in the book. 
To be fair, of course, I'm not familiar with his situation, and obviously something like that would change a person in ways that can't be described, and it's nearly impossible to judge. And what he wants to do with that past is his choice. He doesn't have to share it with anyone. If it wasn't for the rest of his actions, there'd be nothing to justifiably criticize him on. But since we know how he acts otherwise, we can see how his past plays into the same role. What's actually happening is that he doesn't want to place himself in the kind of true connection where one can get hurt. He wants someone close enough to receive their warmth, but enough of a distance away not to be pricked by their quills. He rejects her being part of his support team when it's revealed, because if she sees him during this mission, she'll learn more of those intimate things about him and how he reacts under stress, what he fights for, and in this case, his past which is revealed. And that's close enough that they can cry about it together, that he can get mad and show emotion over it, that their relationship can now have these moments of pain that come from closeness. And that's not what he's seeking. When she says she'll share in his pain if she must, he rejects it harshly. It's his choice to do so, and no one has to let anyone into their past if they don't want to. But it's a confirmation of what we've seen in all their interactions. The reason for his detached togetherness is a choice he makes every single day for the sake of comfort. He isn't willing to give to receive. This is all seen best near the ending, as Rose reveals the true reason they met. It wasn't a grand coincidence, but rather a setup, as she was a spy sent to get close to him, reinventing herself entirely to suit his tastes, from interests to hair color and clothes. She did develop genuine feelings for him from all this, leading her to break the mission and admit it all to him from guilt. But what she says that matters most is that the entire time she was waiting or even wanting to be caught because the pain of receiving love from someone she did as someone she wasn't was a terrible cost. Hoping that he'd catch on, see the convenience, the inconsistencies, the real her somewhere underneath, and from that she could be with him truly, not as a lie. But for arm's length riding, this never came. Consumed in his own tastes, he wouldn't dig deeper to see they were false, and with his comfortable distance, he'd never dig deep enough to notice the cracks. Someone seeking to really know who they were probably would, as they'd eventually see the parts of the story that didn't line up or interests that didn't really seem interesting to them. But he didn't want that closeness. We'll never uncover the lie if we don't want to. What we see in Raiden is a man seeking comfort, ignoring the harsher aspects of reality for the safe and comfortable ones, following orders to ignore blame, discarding the past and as such his entire self to feel better, and changing his mind on the spot for the same reason, ignoring anything like ideals. What we see in Raiden is us. Because Kojima is Kojima, there's a meta-narrative running through the game. It's obvious from the mismarketing that getting a reaction was the point. He wanted people to complain about being Raiden and not Snake. But this is because he wanted people to see that they were like Raiden. And I've spent so much time on his character here in this already overlength video in the same hopes that even a few lines of him felt like you, so we can reflect personally on what comes next. He's described as a digital grunt of the digital age, saying that he feels like some kind of legendary mercenary from all his VR training. I've neglected to say so far that this is his first field mission, until now he's only been trained through simulation. It's not Zanzibar Land or Shadow Moses, it's sneaking 60 and weapons 80. He's been playing a game as the legendary mercenary, but in actuality he's nothing more than a kid behind a screen whining when he realizes that simulation is anything but truth. I don't think I need to belabor how this mirrors the complaints about not playing a snake this go around. Everyone thought they would be a macho action hero, but they're nothing more than a whiny rookie. This intended comparison goes even further because most people said their reaction was, I'll keep going, eventually we'll play a snake again, only to reach the end never having done so. It mimics the way Raiden follows orders, not wanting to do what he is, but doing it anyway because it's what was placed before him. They kept going, wanting to get back to the fantasy of being Snake, the comfort of what they'd known in years prior, ignoring the new, harsher truth in front of them, again similar to how Raiden seeks only comfort in all his motivations. It was a very deliberate move to prime players, getting them into the same mind state as the main character, just before the main character was psychologically torn down and what's come to be known in the years since as the most profound moment in gaming history. 
To get into this though, we need one last bit of the plot, which I've desperately tried to explain in pieces throughout without making this essay my longest ever. We left with Raiden held captive, and of course he breaks free with the help of double agent Olga, who helped him and Snake aboard, under orders from the Patriots? Her child is held hostage by them, and its life is tied to Raiden's and his success, so she has to have him complete this mission and stay alive. They've clearly had a hand in this entire operation, able to sneak double agent into Saul this is most trusted ranks. The Patriots could have called this all off at any moment with Ocelot or Olga delivering one swift blow. So why let it all occur in the first place when it could have been stopped? Well, Ocelot, the constant turncoat in the series, reveals that the Patriots were merely using Solidus. This entire thing has been what's known as the S3 program, the Solid Snake simulation, designed to turn anyone into a snake-like legendary soldier by manipulating them and their conditions. The whole game is a recreation of Shadow Moses with a new coat of paint to this end, an act of mimicry that works. A digital grunt with no field training was led along with just enough clues and hints and orders to stand on par with Snake himself, from bomb disposal to fighting elite soldiers. Raiden's successes, his efforts are all only what they sought to create, as well as Saldus is only being what they sought to use. Fortune, Olga, the President, or Emma, anyone and everyone was merely playing a role in data gathering for S3. With that revealed, Ocelot turns on his comrades again, flees, and leaves Saldus and Raiden to crash into New York on a useless arsenal gear, discarded by all because the real power that was sought to be grasped was information, not weapons. It's also useless in part because the virus our main duo uploaded began to take effect, corrupting the systems of many Metal Gears and Housed, leaving Saldus without the capabilities he happened upon or the data he actually sought. This leaves him needing to kill Raiden to attain the data from his nanomachines instead. It's the cleanup phase of the exercise, where the Patriots are discarding the refuse, even the arsenal they created as cover. The virus also begins to affect the Colonel, though? As Raiden was fighting through Arsenal, Campbell begins to speak in odd, nonsensical calls, saying it's all just a game, referencing the past entries, and, of course, oh so famously, I need scissors. 61. This all leads to Otacon looking into it to reveal that the signal is coming from within Arsenal, not from outside. Combined with his recollection that he's never met Campbell in person, and we learn that Raiden has been speaking to the GWAI throughout the entire mission, which shaped itself to his subconscious, presenting a form which he felt fit to command himself. As Rose revealed herself as an agent as well, she was presumably taken off the mission, replaced by the AI just the same, but we have no idea of knowing if she was ever real in this case just the same. Turns out the Vihar soldier never escaped simulation. Rose and the Colonel then revealed to Raiden, who's now crashed into New York aboard Arsenal with Solidus, that S3 is not Solid Snake simulation, but actually selection for societal sanity. The point wasn't to create the next Solid Snake, as what good is one soldier compared to all of this mayhem? If they can make this entire exercise, what need do they have for a single soldier? Rather, the point was to see if it was possible to begin with. In the most extreme circumstances possible, could someone be manipulated into becoming extreme themselves, like a legendary soldier coming from a rookie? If they can manipulate this situation, then they can manipulate any situation, any one. Through information control, they're able to change the lives and situations of citizens, and that's the point. To combat information overload, they seek to control situations like this. It's been happening the whole time as they led Saldus to hatch this plan, led Fortune to be a tragic heroine, led everyone to set this up. But Raiden, he was more special, because he wasn't a name before this, he wasn't someone that anyone wanted to use. He was kept as no one to test the principle on a more important group than soldiers and leaders and programmers. He was a representative of the mindless masses. This is explained in the concept of convenient truths. The idea that all one does in their decisions is find comfort on the spot by justifying their actions with whatever sounds best for that moment of time, discarding it the second it no longer provides that utility. Like the name says, it's the truth only when it's convenient. 
Raiden's inconsistencies on his relationship with Rose, on his feelings about Snake, on wanting to quit but asking for orders, are explained by this concept. Each is only used for the moment that it makes him feel special or powerful, and then change to whatever prevents negative feelings in the next chapter. Terrorist only means whatever makes him feel best about himself. It's about life being a pleasure-seeking game of ease, and we merely shield ourselves from noticing that with faux, high-minded concepts. We speak of courage or ideals, but only as half-truths, only as a front for our desires. Our actions have no more meaning than this. It's only worsened in the digital age of free-flowing information and these untested truths are able to be found from anyone and anywhere. Nothing is subject to the same level of scrutiny, and everyone is free to access and select whatever they can find that confirms their own positive feelings. You can notice this with a quick Google of anything where you'll find a flood of convincing articles for and against every single stance. The context that denotes reality is lost, and each person selects their evidence, argues a case, and nothing changes because there is no more natural selection for data to move us forward. At its worst, this means that the self is nothing more than cobbled together ideas that make us feel good, chimeras crafted by picking apart the aspects of our favorite things which make us seem special. It's not just that we're seeking comfort, it's that we're nothing but that search. Even as Raiden tries to reject this, saying he'll find something of his own to believe in, the corrupted IAs call him out. But is that even your own idea? Or something Snake told you? And it is. The moment which should be his return to control of the situation is shot down instantly. All he did was select the next convenient truth that he hoped would win him his current argument. The self is discarded and regrown again and again, never defined around more than hedonistic pleasure-seeking under the guise of politeness and individuality. Social evolution stops and we regress to meaningless communication with no point and no end. Believe in yourself and you will succeed. But it's obvious from the start that only a few can succeed. The different cardinal truths neither clash nor mesh. No one is invalidated, but nobody is right. This is something I worry about basically constantly. I put together these long rambles about pieces of media, interjecting my own feelings and hoping that I respect the source material, but even if I do, what is the point of it all? To find truth? To find the equation that solves the world? There is no truth found in it all. The concepts I cover clash at times and merge at others, with each new piece feeling like the next excuse to make myself feel special, to say something that sounds smart and get people on my side to prove my own ego through a graph that goes up. I think about it with people too. When I'm somewhere meeting someone new and they make me feel desirable with an obvious flirt or undeniable attention, is that all it is? Am I shallow, depraved even, simply using the people who have their own deep feelings and motivations for a temporary high of social importance? I know that if it goes much deeper than that, I can be a lot like Raiden, that I can keep people at arm's length, rejecting their help so I don't get hurt, keeping them right where it feels special from their attention but never dangerous to my emotions. I had to write about myself and writing about him, each time holding back the desire to shout it out in a panicked tone to guard your sympathy rather than the scorn I should feel, and here I am, including it anyway to feel tragic and special for my weakness. It's like I can only desire the others in moments away from my work here, away from something that makes me feel special. And so it feels like I must be seeking that feeling from them as well, their praise, setting off into the world of the others only to, to hurt them for my own pleasure. My relationships, my writings, my love for these stories, are these reasons I come up with nothing but a front? Is my self just pleasure? What am I? These things I love and talk about so often, the high concepts they embody, human weakness or free will or justice, do I only love these things because they trigger my animal brain to release the chemical combination I've learned to call uniqueness? When I speak about my favorite pieces, when I place their ideas in new words, am I doing anything more than making their truths my convenience? What is my originality? Where in my life has it ever been? Or for anyone? The genes which initialized my conditions, the situations that limited my options beginning from my parents, what more am I than a creation of what came before me? 
my input? Is it mine or is it a predictable piece in a complex equation that we simply can't understand? Is the solution to the world that it has already been solved, that it's been solved from day one, a mess of destiny rather than free will? This is a profound moment of gaming because the villains here are not speaking in falsehoods despite their harsh nature. Because of how up his own ass Kojima can be, he got people to spend several hours playing as and hating themselves before tearing down the exact reason why that could happen. But it would be naive to discard the harsh nature of the AI entirely. Their arguments which hold weight that this age of infobesity and vapid convenience is in part our fault are also flawed in their own ways. It is true that we are somewhat complacent in our destruction. We create the meaningless content, we flood with posts, we read and share articles that are just pale copies of a copy distilling information down to a useless state, and our desires for more and more sustain that flood. The world would be better if we made an active decision to discard these things, to call them out and refuse to provide them power. This is a fact that we cannot escape. Asking for a change cannot simply become the next convenient truth to feel better about our flaws. But even within this, with this in mind, we must still recognize the source. Who provides all this easy weakness to begin with? Whose lax regulations that mis- and disinformation be churned out with no consequence? Who's stuffing pockets with their profits from such things to ensure it never changes? Who's telling us that value is found in our production into these systems of content and visibility? When we look at it in-universe, yes, Raiden was a weak man asking for others to perform his life for him rather than working of his own volition. He was using others to feel special and blaming his situation. But he was lost in a world of confusion, constantly lorded over by the Patriots and molded into who they desired from a young age, not even allowed to choose love for himself. Of course he'll fall into comfort if they send him someone suited perfectly to his tastes, because he was never allowed to be stronger than that. He may ask for orders, but who's right there to provide the orders? We are all responsible for our weakness, but we must also acknowledge that the power held by others is sustained by placing us into the positions to fall into our weakness to begin with. The GW AI extends this logic it was correctly using against Raiden into a more dangerous territory, where it suggests that they must control him because he is not worthy of controlling himself. Who else could wade through the sea of garbage you people produce, retrieve valuable truths? But they created a situation without free will, and then decided that because no one exercised it, they shouldn't have it. It's a rigged experiment. The data they collected was a biased confirmation. The entire incident was just a ploy. It was a rookie led to be the next snake, a widow made to be Lady Luck, the forgotten president searching for a place in history, a cyborg ninja fighting for her child's life that they stole from her. Everyone was a pawn because they were made to be one. It's manufactured, no more of a true reality to judge things on than the convenient truths that we use to get through the days. The Patriots speak against such things, but they are nothing more. When they say this AI is a consciousness formed in the deepest fabric of American values, it's a defense against all things, a claim which places itself above all to justify anything it does. By saying they are the best qualities of all of us, they refute all arguments before they're heard, making them no better than any of us reading a headline without context and yelling about it. And more so, the well-meaningness of any of their actions relies on the assumption that we, the individuals, are weak and require controlling. Some people might agree with that, saying that humans are so stupid. I hear it day in and day out. But we are not stupid. We have a responsibility in our decisions, but to place the blame entirely on us as some kind of inherent flaw is a convenient truth of its own, an excuse to never be better or ask for better from above. And whatever the correctness of that fact or not, even if it is true and we are stupid, it is one that must be rejected for it leads to nothing positive. What good is there in believing in the worst? What reason is there to believe in things with no benefit to their faith? But in this fight against the AI's cruelty, there isn't exactly power to be found either because it's simply stating that the self is false in another way. If we are not to blame for the weakness we exhibit, this only means that those selves we carry were crafted by someone else. 
If we are products of another, then they still hold the power. Raiden gets a greater excuse for his actions when we acknowledge he was coerced in every single one, but it doesn't change that he has no self of his own creation. That his empty room, vapid relationships, and selected career are nothing more than the Patriot's manipulation. They are right, he doesn't have the skills to exercise free will because it was never afforded to him. Asking for orders wasn't entirely his fault, it's what happened for a reason, though. The rookie is still so, the self is still false, whatever truth we select. When we think about fighting against the powers that control us like Saldus did, are we merely allowed to do so to the extent that it is beneficial to them? Are we even further crafted simply to do so, to put on a stage play of democracy that looks real and acceptable enough to continue the charade? I can complain about the powers above us here all day, but it doesn't change the fact that my words about hating money are making money for the people who already have so much, and that what of it goes to me will simply go to them through a couple more detached layers. Am I really fighting anything? Fighting for anything? Is that opinion my own, or just one I stole from someone else, or what I have been designed to believe for the show? The best state you can leave people in when you have power is with a hope that can never come true, only enough success to keep trying, but never break through. It doesn't matter whether the Patriots are right. It doesn't matter who I am. In this postmodern confusion called Sons of Liberty, we find a simple summary. There is no truth. Reality is only what we perceive with flawed, selfish minds, what others told us to believe. All of these questions, everything presented, has become meaningless. This is the state Raiden is in after defeating Solidus. As he stands amongst the ruins of Federal Hall in New York, he asks himself, Who am I really? Because it is the only question which can arise from what he just endured. He saw that not only was he faking a self, but that even if he wasn't, all that existed was one crafted for him. There is nothing and everything at once, a state of absolute confusion we mirror in this complex ending. But the answer to this question was given at the beginning of this video, and before Sons of Liberty had even begun its tale. The answer is Snake, and so he appropriately appears to impart this lesson. It doesn't matter if they were real or not, that's never the point. The memories you have, and the role you were assigned are burdens you had to carry. But everything you felt, thought about during this mission is yours, and what you decide to do with them is your choice. What he's saying is what he's lived since Shadow Moses, a super soldier clone created only to fight, embracing that destiny and that self as his own since there is no absolute truth, there's only what he sees before him and what he feels about it. There are many things he can't change and he is mostly who his situation crafted him to be, but not entirely. Within that duty there are things which can only be ours, the thoughts and feelings unintercepted by enemy or command. We still react to our situations, we still feel their impact on us. And whether or not it's inherently us or just who we were made to be, it is immutably ours because no one else feels it internally as we do, and we decide who knows it in that. The thoughts and feelings during the mission are our own. Maybe all we achieve is what they wanted us to do, but we did it our way for our reasons. And if that's all we can help while we fight for change, then that's all we can help. It does more than losing ourselves to existential crisis could ever do. There is more to this as well. What he said so far covers more the power side of things, knowing that even in the commands of others, we can decide why we fulfill them, fighting for our own beliefs and not theirs. There is at least a glimpse of self in that already. But he also addresses the convenient truths, our own trickery, when he adds, genes aren't the only thing we pass on. This dedication to the future, taking those thoughts and feelings and turning them into something to pass on, I think defeats the idea of convenient truths by making our passion inconvenient. The capacity that it takes to pass something on, the communication required to take an idea and transfer it to someone else, to make it as interpretable as possible for the future, there's a care and effort behind that which isn't just a lazy day at home or an order from above. It's something more, something so distinctly human. To leave something for a time after our life has ended, after our perception of reality which forms all things is gone. There is no convenience in that. Finding the self, that which is built around what we decide is important enough to pass on, is not an easy task. It is not a convenient truth. 
So our path is the future. What do we feel it needs? What is worth remembering? We pass on a hint of self in this mire of confusion, an immutable truth that we existed in some capacity of our own. The things that were only ours that we choose to make real and then leave behind because they were important. With this knowledge, the S3 program is completed in a funny way because Raiden becomes the next snake carrying on his ideals. The super soldier leaves Raiden to deal with Rose, who appears in the midst of the chaos. He has no idea if the experiences they shared over this past day were real or not, whether she was ever speaking to him or if it was simply another trick of the AI. He asks her who he is and she only responds, I wouldn't know, but we're going to find out together, aren't we? Oh. She wouldn't know for many reasons. It could be because of his convenient truths or the Patriots' manipulation. But he doesn't ask because we already saw it doesn't matter. All he can do is fight for something within those bounds, passing on what he finds important and deriving self from that, whatever the past may be. With a child on the way, he speaks about what a parent can pass on, much more than just genes. They pass on interests, important lessons, ideals, memories, imparting much more than just initial conditions bound by facts we can't change. These things are based on those subjective thoughts and feelings we find in the mission, the ones only we know and only we decide what should and shouldn't be shared from them. The Patriots might have brought them together, or they might not have. It might have simply been grand coincidence. But the decision to be with her now is firmly his, and that's all he can change, and that's all that matters. The rest remains special between him and her, as he says, this is for your ears only. The only thing left to mention are the dog tags he discards upon these realizations. They have the player's name on them, inputted well before at the onset of the game. When Snake asks if he knows the name, Raiden says he's never heard it before and throws them to make his own name instead. By tossing them away, he separates himself from us, breaking that connection crafted across the experience. It seems rather clear. He's moved on from where he started. But have you?